Hello, thank you for joining us today for our distance advocacy workshop. I'm Susan Dixon. I'm your state chair of government relations. And I'd like to introduce Jennifer Baker. Hi, I'm Jennifer Baker. I am a legislative advocate with Murdoch, Walrath and Holmes. And I am here to make sure that everything CalRTA would like to see take place within the halls of the legislature and over at CalSTRS are accomplished. Thank you. Yes. And today what we're going to do is we're going to go over our distance advocacy section on the CalRTA, CalRTA website that we just recently retooled and how we can continue to advocate through distance advocate, advocacy and moving forward with our elected officials. Um, next slide, please. We're going to be covering our new CalRTA tools. And I'm going to shut off my webcam. And I'm going to shut off mine. And we are going to move into the next slide. We're going to cover the CalRTA tools that we're providing you that have been updated on our website. We have a new section with a toolkit for virtual advocacy to make it easier and seamless for our members to be able to contact their ele elected officials. Jennifer is going to be covering the updated state budget and legislation update, which has been changing on an hourly basis. So um, that's always going to be an interesting section. Next slide, please. One of the major areas that CalRTA has been doing the last um, over 90 years is advocating. And we've changed from driving down the dusty roads to now a virtual advocacy method. COVID-19 put us all into a mode where we immediately had to change how we were going to advocate for our members, how we were going to stay in touch with our elected officials, and how we were also going to stay connected with our membership. So recently, our, the three of us worked on, with the help of Debbie Pate Newberry, updating our sections on the CalRTA website. The action advocacy section is the main section that is on the home page that will give you all the tools and information that you as a member or non-members can access to be able to get the materials and resources to connect with our elected officials. On the side, the right side of this slide, you can see that we recently redid the website it's very seamless now, it's cleaner. It has the three um, areas at the top, division resources, vir virtual advocacy toolkit, current legislation. When you go to the resources under each of those, you're gonna get a, a large number of documents and materials and information that you can access that will be updated as it is needed. Below that, we have basic talking points, facts and figures. Again, materials to distribute, and this and that. These materials are key in the fact that we are now unable to meet in person with our membership, but that doesn't mean we are not connecting with our members. So we wanna be able to provide them, get them to use the website on a regular basis and to be able to access these. Next slide, please. You can see, for example, under Division GRC Resources, once you click on the resources, there are a large number of materials that you can access. This changes as needed, as I said. So the second one is now our new push for the WEP GPO repeal. It's called the Summer of Advocacy. To be able to share with our membership, what are we asking from them to do this summer? We have retooled it so that you can see the Summer of Advocacy tools are three regular weekly legislative alerts. Tuesday is Take Action Tuesday, it is directed toward repealing the WEP GPO by focusing on contacting 10 members of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. I change those every month so that we are continually emailing and alerting them to this cause. 
We've retooled the Wake Up Wednesdays to be for our state issues. And as you notice, the last couple of weeks, we were focusing on asking the governor to be sure that there were not cuts to the public education system. And then on Thursdays, that again is focusing on the repeal of the WEP GPO, and we are contacting key members of the Ways and Means Committee. Next slide, please. This is an example of just some of the materials that you can access and use, and you can print from the website. When we were able to meet, these three documents where we would share with our elected officials. These are powerful. When they want to know the cost, you can see from the, the, the graph, it's a very simple amount. It's a very small amount of the annual Social Security output. This was a suggestion from um, Representative Linda Sanchez to not just talk about the actual money cost, but the cost in relation to the output. If you look at the next slide, another suggestion is what we've been using, the scenario. Some of our elected officials would say things like, what, why teachers in 15 states did not pay into Social Security. Why would they be eligible for the spousal Social Security? We showed them that in other cases in the private sector, women or spouses who did not pay or meet that 40 quarters we're already collecting spousal social security. Truly, personally, I believe this is one of the things that changed a few of our elected officials' minds that had not been co-sponsored. When we shared these materials with them and talked about it, they were able to see it in print. And now more than ever, since we're going to have to advocate through virtual advocacy that I'm going to be going over, you want to be able to have these documents sent ahead of time so you can speak to them. Next slide, please. The next slide is just again, shows you some of the documents that we have access to as members. How does social security penalties for teachers? You can download, print this if you are meeting in person. If you're not, you can download and send the PDF to your elected officials. And then the next slide, please. There's many more documents, by the way, that you can access. Under current legislation, this is where I really rely on um, David Walrath and Jennifer Baker as our legislative advocates to keep us up to date on what the current legislation is ever changing under our state and our federal. The legislative alerts are the alerts that we send out every on a weekly basis. If you are not receiving them up at the top, it will ask you to sign up for the email alerts. If members aren't comfortable signing up, they can always go to these legislative alerts. They are now archived. Debbie Payne Newberry has done a, a tremendous job helping make this seamless, simple, and easy for all of our members to be able to send a legislative alert to their elected official. If you go to the next slide, you can see once you click on the legislative alerts where it says join our mailing list. If you're not receiving them, please sign up. There's no advertising. There's no uh, situation where you're going to be hacked if you're receiving a secure email from CalRTA. When you go and you see, for example, uh, the Tuesday alert that's listed email today, the second one, if you weren't able to do it on Tuesday, you were out of town or you were just busy, you can archive this. Click on that. And the next slide, please. Once you do it, it automatically populates. Here are the, the uh, representatives. On the Thursday alert, we have Nancy Powers, who's Chairman Larson's staff contact. You click on her name and you can see over on the right, it populates into your email, the message is there. All you have to do is simply sign your name. Easy breezy. Next slide, please. We are changing, as we said, ever, ever more each and every week. One of the easiest way to contact elected officials 
if you are not their constituent, is to do it through Twitter. We have this on the website where you can actually go and find out how the directions are to set up a Twitter account. If you wanted to contact Mitch McConnell, we're not in his area. You go to his website, you're not going to be able to write him any information or a request, but you can do it through a Twitter account. We have an easy to use step-by-step -step guide. If you go to the next slide, please. And we actually have sample tweets. When you're asking where, who is my legislature? I'm always getting emails. Who is my representative? Who is my state senator? I always will help you find those. It's simple. You know your zip code. On our website, you go to this section, find your representative for the state, for the federal, click on it with your zip code, you'll find out who your elected official is. And then the next slide, please. We also have on the website, the California State Senate calendar. Um, one thing Jennifer has been, and David have been very good about apprising me of is this has changed a lot. So we hope it's up to date, but because of COVID-19 and the way that a lot of our um, elected officials are meeting, this may not be up to date when they're in their office. But that's the beauty, the beauty of virtual advocacy. Someone's always there. Uh, responding to an email. They still receive those emails. Next slide, please. The most recent um, section on the CalRTA website under Advocacy Action is our Advocacy Toolkit. Jennifer and I worked the last couple weeks and decided it was really important to be able to have all the materials and instructions that you need to be able to advocate virtually. We're all on a computer, we all can access this information simple, and there's no reason you cannot request a meeting with your state assemblymen, your state senators, your um, uh, congressperson, your state senators, and your federal, and, and your our two senators, Feinstein and Harris. You can do it now through a virtual Zoom request. And the next slide, please. You can see once you go there, we have these sections. Tips for advocating. Here's a distant meeting checklist. How do you find your legislature? Again, it's repeated from another section of the website, but it's right here if you're on virtual advocacy. I want to set up a meeting. How do I do it? We have a sample email meeting request you can copy and paste. We have the talking points. We have a lot of the documents you may want to send if you're doing a state or a federal issue. We review the do's and don'ts of lobbying. And then most important, we go over the CalRTA advocacy platform. And the major um, situation that we always try to make sure that our elected officials and our members know the CalRTA advocacy platform is driven by our members' needs. We have the four sections and areas that we focus on, CalSTRS retirement, federal issues, mostly concerning the WEP GPOs penalties, healthcare and healthy aging, and public schools. That is what we advocate and legislate for. The platform defines those. Every two years we do a survey. You will be all receiving a survey in September. It will prioritize what are our members' needs and wants. That is how the platform is written. The next section, if you look at the federal part on the CalRT, that's, that's fine. You can see, again, all those handouts are there. We have the WEP GPO repeal handouts in color and in black and white. Because in color, when we meet in person, if you're having a division meeting or an area meeting, it's really cost effective to print it for members in black and white. 
when you are printing it for an elected official, I always recommend we use color. Next slide, please. Again, you can see these. this is what's listed in the CalRT Advocacy Toolkit. Everything you need to be able to stay connected with our elected officials. Today, more than ever, it's imperative that we advocate on a regular basis and in mass. When we wrote the new ledge alerts to request that the WEP GPO is put into one of the stimulus plans or the penalties be suspended, it came from Rodney Davis's office. He has been trying to get HR 141 into a stimulus plan since it began in April. So we decided we'd help him out. He's the author of HR 141. Very important, and we hear it from all of our elected officials when we talk to them in Zoom meetings and emails. If you want to be heard, you need to do it on a regular basis and you need to do it in mass. So that's why we're asking all of our members to become more familiar with our website, how to advocate virtually, when our representatives come home in August, how to set up a Zoom meeting so that you still stay connected with our congressmen. We have to remember that the push for the repeal is essential to continue and do now. September and October begin, our elected officials are gonna be very concerned with re-election or election. A lot of situations and a lot of new legislation is going through Congress. We don't want them to forget about the needs of our membership. And the next slide, please. You can see again, we're just going through simplifying what are you doing in advocacy? You can request a video meeting. You can send an email. You can still use the phone. It's imperative though to remember if you want to meet with your elected officials, you go through the system, you they will set up the Zoom meeting and they are usually um, very encouraged to be able to get members and constituents to speak to either staff or the elected official. And I'm almost sure they're, all, they're more active now meeting virtually through Zoom than to try and catch them in, in person. So remember that for upcoming August. Susie, can I add a little note onto, sure. onto that aspect? Uh, so this is Jennifer, and one of the things I want to encourage you to, to also be aware of is there could be some differences between how your federal representatives want to meet and how your state representatives want to meet. Some of your state representatives may actually want you to put together uh, the uh, information for a video call or a conference call, or some of the offices uh, may do it themselves. So it's going to be very important important when you have a conversation with them to try to find out what they believe is going to be the, the best way to move forward and then work to try to accommodate that. And if you need help in trying to set something up, we're here for you to help make that process more easy. That's correct. Thank you, Jennifer. That's, that is so on point because there is, it, and everyone is learning and moving into new modes. So we have to be flexible and receptive to how they want us to meet. Um, if you go to the next slide, as Jennifer said, we are here to help. Um, CalRTA has a Zoom account. We have GoToMeeting accounts. The Government Relations Committee has a GoToMeeting account. You need help setting up an account, a meeting for a state official, we're here for you. Just contact one of us. Key of, of reminding yourself now, we did this for years when we advocated in person. We always went over what do you do before you meet with the elected official? What do you do during the meeting? It hasn't changed that much. So we need to be educated and proactive 
that you want to still follow these guidelines. Study your legislator's web website. Know how many people are in the affected area. That's key. We can get the information of retirees on the CalSTRS website. It's very powerful to say, did you know in your area you have, you know, 11,000 active teachers and 4,000 retired teachers? Really brings it more as an important issue when you're able to share how many of their constituents are affected by whatever issue you're presenting. Same thing when you go into a video call, all of these key areas. And if, again, if you need assistance, and you want to learn more about it, we're going to be having more webinars just about the website and how you advocate virtually. Next slide, please. And I think this is the most important thing. This is going to kind of move into um, Jennifer's role. If you are have been involved in government relations or if you're new to it, it's important that we know that we move through the legislative advocates, this actually, if you go on the right, um, they analyze the legislation and they present the recommendation to our committee if we ask them. They tell us exactly what the legislation means and what implications it will have. Then the Government Relations Committee reviews the legislation ballot propositions. We've been doing virtual meetings now for three years, but all of our meetings are virtual. So we have legislative meetings that are virtual. Our committee makes a position recommendation. I then present those recommendations to the CalRTA Board of Directors. These arrows kind of, it should have been moved the other way. Um, and then once I present it to the Board of Directors, our CalRTA Board of Directors makes the final decision on the committee's recommendations. When we're looking at legislation, again, we look at the platform. We don't, there's thousands of different pieces of legislation, state and federally. We, are, we rely on our legislative advocates to find the ones that are only addressing those four areas of our platform. So in the next slide then, that goes into Jennifer Baker's role as our one of our legislative advocates. And she's thank gonna- you so Oh, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Susie. And uh, before we actually uh, go into the next uh, part of the website, we're actually going to do a little poll. We're gonna be doing two polls today. And the first poll that I'm sending out to you is, uh, do you receive the Cal RTA alerts? Uh, can you take a moment, click on whether or not you receive the alerts, whether or not you take action, and make sure you s click the submit button. You have to click the submit button in order for everything to go through. What we're trying to do is to get a better idea of um, what we can do to ensure that we're as effective as possible with the alerts going out and most helpful for you and all of our uh, members to make sure that, um, that we're as responsive as possible. All right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close that poll. And uh, thank you so much. It looks like 12% uh, of you received the alerts. 79% of you not only read, uh, receive the alerts, but are taking action. 9% uh, of you don't receive the alerts, but as you've seen uh, on Susie's presentation, uh, we've now walked you through what you need to do to receive that, and we can make sure that we're sending out information so uh, you can ensure that uh, you can learn how to sign up to receive them if you would like to get that. So thank you for that. We're going to do one more poll um, at the uh, at the end of my presentation and I did 
want to let you know because I did, uh, I forgot to mention it earlier on. If you have any questions, please write them in the question box in your, uh, which is on uh, your toolbox on your screen. We do have a section for questions. If you have any, please write your questions down and we will try to get to as many questions as possible in the question and answer section of our website. So with that, um, I'm going to go into the state uh, budget and legislative update. I'm going to first start with legislation and then I'm going to close with the budget. And I do have to let you know that um, this is literally up to date. Uh, so you are actually going to be one of the first groups that's actually hearing what is actually going to be in the components of the budget that the legislature's uh, voting on um, within the next 48 hours as negotiated with the governor. So this is really a uh, good juicy gossip from Sacramento I'm going to be sharing with you. But first, let me give you some other fun gossip, and that's going to be legislation. Uh, so I first wanted to tell you about some of the bills that CalRTA has been active on and what's happened uh, during the legislative process. The first bill that I wanted to know is was SB 795 by Senator Bell. And initially, CalRTA had taken an opposed position because what this bill would have done would have was take property taxes from local schools saying, don't worry, we're going to pay you back from the general fund, so we won't actually do you any fiscal harm. But what we knew from experience during the Great Recession was that when uh, when legislators promised us that they would never suspend Prop 98, we found out that they lied because they actually suspended Prop 98 twice. What happened was uh, districts were actually more reliant on their property tax revenue uh, when Prop 98 was suspended. We also knew it was likely we could potentially go into another economic decline surprise, surprise, look what has happened. Uh, so we said, no, we need to oppose this bill because we can't take a chance of you taking away one of the few, to few tools that our districts have to try to keep themselves whole during an economic downturn. Let me just say that Senator Bell did not appreciate those conversations, but nevertheless, CalRTA and other education advocates held firm, and we were able to convince Senator Bell to amend his bill so it no longer impacts school property taxes. So that was a huge win because it could have um, impacted literally hundreds of millions of dollars cumulatively at the local level. So that was a huge victory. The next bill that CalRTA uh, has a support position on is SB 956 by Senator Jackson. And what this bill would help to do is bring additional transparency and accountability uh, to California's tax dollars and how they're being used. And a lot of folks might say, well, what does that have to do with schools? The reality is 40% of every dollar uh, of a tax credit or a tax exemption is actually money that would have gone to schools. So when you create a tax credit, you are literally subsidizing that tax credit with education dollars, which means if you're gonna spend money on a tax credit or exemption, you need to make sure that it's justified, it's achieving its goals, and from a policy perspective, that it's okay to use those monies for whatever this economic goal is, as opposed to funding kids in schools. Uh, so what this bill would do is create a board that would view um, all of the, uh, the most expensive uh, corporate tax credits uh, that California has spent uh, money on in the last decade. And just in the last decade, the 10 most expensive corporate tax credits alone, just the top 10, have cost California more than $85 billion. And let me remind you, this was literally during the Great Recession. So while we had a recession, we were suspending Prop 98, we were cutting money from schools, from healthcare and social services, we were still funding uh, corporate tax dollars, uh, corporate tax uh, credits. So uh, the hope is that it will ensure that our tax policy is more in line with the long run. 
to ensure that we're not spending money where we should. Uh, but this bill would actually not eliminate any of them. It just ensures that a board that's going to be created is going to make recommendations to the legislature on whether or not these tax credits are actually achieving the goals that they've been out to uh, achieve or not. And if they haven't, then perhaps the legislature may want to change that for some, or if some are achieving their goals, then they can certainly continue uh, the work that they were doing. So this bill has move, uh, been moving forward um, this bill uh, is uh, was literally just passed off the Senate floor yesterday. So um, I did not update it, but you should know, Susie was right. The legislature is getting a lot of work done. So the bill is now, it's, it's in the process of moving from the Senate to the Assembly. The next bill that I'm going to cover is AB 683 by Assembly Member Carrillo. And this bill is a measure that CalRTA has supported. And uh, what Assembly Member Carrillo is trying to do is she's trying to uh, ensure that those uh, that need to utilize Medi-Cal services um, are going to have some of the constraints that make it more difficult for them to become eligible for Medi-Cal uh, uh, to try to eliminate some of those constraints. So what it says is that you don't have to take certain assets and resources. So when you would have to count a car, different life insurance policies to determine whether or not you are Medi-Cal eligible, that you don't, you are, will no longer have to do that uh, because that can be very prohibitive. You might have a, a life insurance policy or a car but if you're actually forced to sell your only car in order to be Medi-Cal eligible, how are you gonna get to any of the appointments that you're gonna have? It just doesn't make sense. So uh, Assembly Member Carrillo is trying to change this bill. Granted, it would be subject to federal approval, but what they're trying to do is change the conversation. This bill has uh, re very recently moved from the Assembly to the Senate. And just so you understand, um, uh, so remember uh, back in the 80s, there was the uh, uh, cartoons on the TV about, I'm just a bill. So if you hearken back to how a bill becomes law, you first have, uh, the bills have to move from a policy to a fiscal committee, have to be passed by a policy committee, then passed by a fiscal committee, then they go to the House. So assembly bills go to the assembly floor, Senate bills go to the Senate floor. Once they pass each of their houses, they then switch houses and have to go through that same process in the other house. If they make it through both houses, they get to pass go, Nobody gets $200, but uh, the bill then goes down to the governor for determination. So we are at that point in time where we're now seeing measures move from one house to another. So that's just what's happened with the last two bills. Um, and the next bill I wanted to talk about was AB 2100 by Assembly Member Wood. Assembly Member Wood is the chair of the Assembly Health Committee. He has been very intricately involved in a number of discussions, which is uh, which have been taking uh, place around the healthcare arena. And what he's trying to do is trying to make it easier for individuals uh, to get their uh, Medi-Cal prescription drug benefits. So what he's doing is making a number of changes regarding the Department of Healthcare Services in order to provide supplemental Medi-Cal ingredient cost reimbursement. So basically what happens is a lot of pharmacies, um, they're not actually putting the prices that um, they're paying for when they purchase the, um, the ingredients for prescriptions. And so what happens is the person that's actually getting the prescription wind up, winds up paying a higher cost. So you're paying an inflated cost. So what he wants to try to do is ensure that those costs are not going to be inflated as part of a broader effort to try to reduce overall prescription costs. This bill has also just moved from the Assembly to the Senate. I'm going to be going over a few more additional bills. It's been a very busy year, but actually, let me take a quick moment to pause and just say, we actually had quite a few more bills that we were involved mm -hmm. with, but when the legislature took a break and they took their pause because of the pandemic, when they came back, they said, we're going to make a determination not to move bills that are not directly related to the pandemic 
or to the economy or to some urgent need that California needs to pass right now. So many of the bills that CalRTA had taken positions on, uh, the pause button was set. Those bills um, then stopped moving forward, uh, but it is likely many of them will be reintroduced next year. So that's one of the reasons I'm not gonna be covering um, as many bills as you might typically see. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I made that note so you understand why are some bills moving forward, but maybe I heard about another bill, how come I'm not hearing it here? That is primarily uh, the reason why that would take place. So with that, um, the next bill I wanted to cover is SB 852 by Senator Pan. Senator Pan is the chair of the Senate Health Committee. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to also uh, address the overall issue with prescription drugs. And so what he's working on doing is creating a new office of drug contacting and manufacturing within one of our state agencies, which is the California Health and Human Services Agency. And ultimately what he wants to accomplish through that is to try to increase competition, which would then ultimately lower prices while also addressing some of the shortages in our overall market and economy for our generic prescription drugs. So overall, what he's trying to do is address some of those systemic issues that we have with the lack of affordable prescription drugs or a lack of available generic prescription drugs for our California consumers. This bill is on the Senate floor. The Senate uh, is actually meeting all this week. They're literally meeting as I'm speaking right now. So it is possible that this bill may be coming up as uh, I'm presenting, but whenever we do the next legislative update, we'll definitely see uh, what is going to happen with that measure. And then the next measure, no. AB 2471 by Assembly Member Manchison is a bill that CalRTA also supported. And what this is trying to do is it's trying to protect seniors by um, uh, providing more time for you to have the right to cancel contracts if you're 65 eight years or older uh, from three days to five um, for very, very complicated contracts, such as um, if you're looking at, uh, at buying or selling a home or changing your home mortgage, uh, a very broad uh, uh, contract that you might be uh, entered into, having a new heater installed or a new air conditioner, something that could be extremely expensive. Life insurance policies. Um, oftentimes, um, it ta it, it's very uh, complex sometimes to read through fine print. And um, we have seen an increase in um, individuals trying to take advantage of our senior population. So what this bill would do is provide a little more day, uh, a little more time from three days to five to try to mitigate some of those issues of exploitation that unfortunately many of our senior populations have had to deal with. This bill has also just moved from the assembly uh, to the Senate uh, and will likely be heard very shortly. We just have a couple of more uh, bills until I go into the budget. Um, uh, two more bills, assembly member uh, 22, 2219 by assembly member O'Donnell. Uh, this is a measure that was sponsored by CalSTRS that Cal, uh, RTA supported. And what it would do is it uh, would authorize CalSTRS to offer an IRA in addition to a Roth IRA um, and allow them to be able to accept rollovers. Um, some of you may already be aware that CalSTRS has a uh, pension too program and that allows um, our teachers to be able to utilize pension two as an alternative to other uh, 403Bs that are out there. And they have a number of different supplementary products that our teachers can invest into to have additional an additional retirement mechanism when they retire. So this would allow uh, CalSTRS to provide an additional tool in the toolbox to help teachers to be able to save for retirement and ha therefore have a more secure retirement. Unfortunately, this was one of the bills that was do, uh, pulled because of the refocusing on COVID-19, but we have been in communication with CalSTRS about plans to reintroduce it next year, depending on what's happening uh, with the legislative process. Now, but the last bill that I wanted uh, to, to talk about is something that CalRTA wound up being extremely involved with, and that's AB 2998 by Assemblymember Kylie. CalRTA um, 
proposed uh, amendments that were being planned to be dropped into a bill. It's called a Gutten Amend. And uh, you might, uh, another way to think about it is uh, Assembly Member Kylie was trying to pull a fast one. And what he wanted to do was to, at the last minute, drop amendments into a bill that literally would have eliminated the CalSTRS defined benefit pension for new educators. So uh, eliminate retirement security. This would imp impact the majority of women because 72% of CalSTRS members are women. Um, it would have had a, a very detrimental impact on trying to recruit and retain teachers that I could go on and on. And so we found out what assembly member Kylie was going to do sent out a legislative alert. So one of the alerts that Susie was talking about earlier, if you were to click on those alerts and see what happened in the past, uh, what CalRTA did, you could see the alert that went out. And uh, we had so many CalRTA members calling uh, the assembly member Freddie Rodriguez's office because he was the chair of the committee that would have heard this bill, that his chief of staff got my cell phone number called me and said, oh my gosh, all the phones for our office are transferred to me because no one can be in the office and I can't get any of my work done because your members keep calling. And he said, I have to tell you, your members are some of the most effective advocates I've ever talked to. We're not going to hear the bill. You can call them off, please call them off so I can get my work done. That was a huge success. So thanks to our CalRTA members, uh, we were able to not only keep this bill from moving forward, we were able to work to make sure that it never even saw the light of day. Um, and, um, and that was all because of the great work that you had done. So thank you so much for that. If some of you that are on this webinar were uh, some of the individuals that made contact, it really made a difference. And it helped to not only secure um, a good retirement for our current and future teachers, but by ensuring we have CalSTRS members always coming into the system, that helps to ensure that your own retirement is protected. So not you not only helped others, but you helped yourselves in that process as well. So let's get to some juicy gossip, shall we? I know folks always love to hear about what's going on in Sacramento. So I wanted to let you know that the budget is literally being voted on tonight by the Senate, the California Senate. So here's what happened. The legislature passed, I don't wanna call it a phony budget because they did a lot of work to get there, but the governor had proposed in the May revise um, a very draconian budget. It, include, uh, it included over $8 billion worth of cuts to education alone. Um, it would have really slashed and burned. And he, he created the May revise with the philosophy, let's cut the budget now, but if we get additional federal funding, then we will use that funding to bring those programs back. And uh, the, the education community, we've had a number of conversations with the legislature, Department of Finance and Governor said, there is no way we can reopen schools. We're barely able to function as is. If you make all these cuts, you're virtually guaranteeing, not only can we not really open schools, but if you still force us to, we can't provide a safe environment for kids physically to keep them safe, and we can't also provide a safe learning environment for them to learn. The legislature listened, and the legislature pushed back to the governor and said, Governor, we're gonna call your bluff on this. We are actually going to assume that we are gonna get federal funding, and we're gonna create a timeline, and if we don't get that federal funding, then we will we'll make some cuts in other parts of the budget, but when it comes to the education budget, instead of making cuts, we're just going to institute deferrals. So they did pass that budget on June 15th, which is a constitutional deadline to sign a budget. And then the legislative leadership met with the governor and they essentially hashed out a new budget. And that new budget is what you're actually seeing here. It was literally just released earlier this week. The, um, the, it, not all of the components of the budget are even eligible to be heard until tomorrow. Only two of them are eligible to be heard tonight because of various uh, legislative deadlines and rules that the legislature has to follow. But tonight, it's probably going to be around nine o'clock that the Senate is actually going to vote on some of the major components 
of this budget package and the assembly is coming in tomorrow they're going to come in at one who knows what time they're going to finish i mean i'm making bets with people on whether the senate's going to finish by midnight or not tonight but the reality is it's very likely by uh, by the end of the week that the, the budget will act, the compromise budget will be passed by the legislature. Once that happens, the governor is gonna have 12 days to sign the budget. Since this has already been a compromise budget that's been agreed to between the governor and the legislature, there is a possibility that the governor may choose to sign it uh, early next week before the start of the next fiscal year, which is July 1st. So that's just a little bit of extra gossip behind the, uh, behind the curtain in Sacramento on how we got here. So the highlights of the budget and what it includes, it, uh, this compromise budget does assume that we are going to get approximately $14 billion in federal support. The timeline that the that was created in this budget assumes that if we don't get the money or if, if the federal government does not give us additional funds, and if it doesn't happen by October 15th, then there are going to be a series of triggers and reductions throughout the budget. Fortunately for education, as I noted, uh, we are not going to get budget reductions, but we are instead going to get budget deferrals. And I have to say, education really made out. I, let me let me correct that. K through 14 education really made out because our UC and CSU systems are going through a series of potential cuts. And also, there are a number of areas within healthcare, within social services, throughout other aspects of the budget that are going to potentially look at very devastating cuts. Uh, but there are a few notes in there that I just wanted to make sure I shared. Um, if we get less than the $14 billion um, that, uh, that this budget assumes that we would get at the federal level, then essentially the, we're going to get proportionate reductions to a series of items. There's a list that the legislature provided um, and our, uh, the deferrals that are gonna be in place for our K-12 system as well as community colleges. The deferrals might wind up being even larger if we get less than $14 billion at the federal level. Um, uh, so that is kind of where we are with the federal support and what we're likely looking at uh, in the future. Uh, the budget that was created doesn't uh, assume uh, that we are going to uh, end the day with approximately $11.4 billion in total reserves. So even uh, making cuts, uh, we are still have additional funds and reserves. And the way some of our rainy day funds actually work, so Prop 2, the way that's set up, which is one of our, our, our rainy day fund, you're actually only able to take out a certain amount each year. And the legislature and governor are trying to continue to have a cushion because there is an assumption this is unfortunately not going to be an overnight recession. And that sure is a shame. Um, so despite that, um, the, the legislature and governor are uh, also setting over $700 million aside for addi additional emergency uh, funds to address the pandemic. And as many of you may have been hearing, we are seeing uh, significant uh, increases in the number of Californians that are testing positive. And we are beginning to see a strain on hospitals. The governor is also indicating that the state may be, uh, begin to actually slow down uh, the opening up that was uh, being planned. So we don't know exactly where this is all going to go, but we do know that uh, there has been an economic cushion uh, that's being put together to make sure that California is able to address all of our needs. So on to healthcare. So um, the, uh, the good news is that um, there are some cuts uh, that were not going to take place, but there is some bad news to healthcare that uh, that CalRTA was. Uh watching and trying to support through the legislative process. Um, there was a bill that, uh, that CalRTA did take a support position on, and it would have uh, created the Office of Healthcare Affordability. And when the governor uh, had presented his January budget, he had also proposed creating an Office of Healthcare Affordability. And so we were involved in those conversations uh, uh, saying, this is a great idea. How, do, how can we be helpful to make this happen? And 
And unfortunately, uh, when, uh, when the economy began to take, um, this was recommended uh, not to move forward in the May revise. And that was one of the aspects that the legislature did agree with because it would have been a new cost. So unfortunately, that idea has been stalled. Uh, we hope that we might see that come back sometime in the near future. And similarly, this had also been the same kind of discussion uh, when it came to the state conversations about creating its own state generic drug label. Um, in the January budget, the governor had proposed creating a state generic drug uh, uh, label so that we could provide Californians with more affordable prescriptions to try to address some of those systemic needs. Um, and unfortunately, this was also something that's been paused because those would have been new costs. Uh, but this is certainly a conversation that I know is uh, very important to CalRTA members. And so we're going to be uh, watching to see where those conversations are going to go. But I did want to provide the unfortunate um, bad news that those two wonderful um, items for discussion are being paused for right now. But some good news when it comes to healthcare is the May revise would have proposed eliminating over $54 million uh, in funding uh, to provide uh, various services through Medi-Cal benefits. Um, and that would have been uh, funny to provide uh, adult dental, optometry, optician, audiology, and a number of items. They were going to be cut. And we just said, this is not the time to be cutting uh, healthcare for seniors in this aspect. And uh, those conversations were all successful. So I did want to let you know, while there is some unfortunate news in the healthcare world uh, when it comes to the budget, that there are still uh, some rays of sunshine that are gleaming out there. And so we'll continue to look out for some more of those that we can share with our members. When it comes to taxes, um, I did note in legislation AB 956, so um, I wanted to, to remind you of that conversation because this is in direct relation to that. Um, the May revise had uh, recommended that we suspend some tax credits for three years. Um, in order to save the state some money, because as I noted, 40% of revenue that's created for these tax credits or that's taken away from these tax credits is money that would have gone to school. So um, we've, uh, a number of groups have been having conversations with the legislature over the last two years saying there needs to be more education about this issue because it's not something that stakeholders are aware of. It's not something that the legislature or a lot of governor staff are aware of. And this is having a major impact on the lack of education funding. So fortunately, uh, the folks in the governor's office paid attention uh, during those conversations and said, hey, we're going to pick out a couple of tax credits and we're going to just suspend them for three years. They're not being eliminated, but just by suspending these tax credits for the next few years are going to generate um, cumulatively uh, over $9 billion from the state over the next three years. And education is going to see over 40% of the funds from that because then that means we're not subsidizing these various tax credits uh, with education dollars. So that's great news and that helps to minimize the cuts or reductions and additional deferrals that we would see for education. So I am going to bring bringing these issues up more because it's very under, important to understand tax policy because there is a direct link between tax policy and education funding. But let's save that for another day. Let's first go into the education budget and say that um, ultimately uh, the education budget um, is not as bad as it would have been in the May revise. So that's very good. It doesn't mean it's perfect, uh, but it's certainly better than it would have been. So first, we are receiving additional one-time federal funds, and those come from the CARES Act that many of you may have heard about, and that's to help deal with learning loss, particularly for our students with disabilities and low-income students, English learners, and foster youth. So um, it, uh, our schools will be able to utilize that for direct costs. We're also getting an additional $1.4 billion in um, um, ESSA, Elementary and sec Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds that are going to go directly to our schools based on our, their Title I allocation. We're also going to get cumulatively um, around $100 billion for this current fiscal year, for 2021. So uh, $70.5 billion
volume of that is specifically coming from Prop 98. So when we look at the total dollars that are being provided for schools, what that means is we're gonna get a little over 17,000 per student. That's okay. Uh, is that the highest in the nation? Certainly not. We have a long way to go. Um, and additionally, we might even get an additional $6.6 .6 billion if we see some additional federal, federal aid. So that might bump up that $17,000 number a little bit, uh, but that's uh, essentially where we are when it comes to funding. Uh, the, the compromise budget did reject the 10% reduction to the local control funding formula. Um, so that would have been that $8 billion in cuts that a lot of you had been hearing about that was rejected. Unfortunately though, uh, this compromise budget does deny a COLA for the LCFF. That was a big item uh, that we were hoping would stay um, included in the budget because as you know, costs are increasing for schools in a number of areas. So if you don't uh, provide a COLA, then that means you're kind of eroding the overall budget. But unfortunately, uh, the legislature was not successful in keeping that in the compromise budget. Uh, a few other aspects with the education budget, um, it provides billions of dollars in deferrals and um and, but in addition it also is doing some deferment in paying so essentially instead of paying us on uh, june 30th it pays us on july 1st so by doing that it's it's kind of a uh, an accounting trick in order for the state to be able to uh to save some funds but then it also includes a billion to dollars in deferrals so if we don't get the additional federal funds that the state is asking the federal government to provide then we're going to see our local school districts having to institute a number of deferrals and but there are and there are additional provisions because some small school districts may have a very difficult time in getting those deferrals instituted at the local level so there there are providing additional funds about 300 million dollars to help make that happen and provide assistance for our, some of the smaller local districts that might have a, a difficult time with that but some of the trade-offs that were included um, because uh, our schools are not getting the cuts that other parts of the budget are getting. Uh, one of the trade-offs is that the legislature and governor are, are prohibiting any layoffs for certificated and classified employees. They're saying schools, if you're not getting cut like, any, uh, like other areas of the budget, then we're not gonna let you cut staff. Also because they're saying, well, you're gonna need those additional staff because of social distancing. Uh, but this does, uh, it, this has been a controversial discussion in the world of school management who is saying, wait a second, you're tying our hands and eliminating some of the tools that we have in, in order to address some fiscal needs. So this was a very colorful topic as I'm sure that you can understand whether you're listening, if you were a certificated member or uh, whether you were an administrator or a superintendent, you can understand this was a very colorful discussion, and this is now part of the budget compromise that's going to be moving forward. And that is specific to the current budget year, which is 2021. It also provides a hold harmless provision for schools, meaning that um, they are going to get funded for the amount of kids that, that they have, have had this year. And if they lose more kids, their budgets aren't gonna be cut for this year because they are anticipating we're gonna see some shifts of kids moving around districts or per, perhaps going to homeschool. Uh, and so they wanna make sure that districts don't suffer economically because of that. There are a number of additional short-term, both fiscal and academic uh, issues that the legislature and governor are providing flexibility uh, you know, for and, um, and to recognizing that with distance education, it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to check many of the boxes that have been set out uh, to be checked. And then finally, a big win is um, we're seeing a $645 million uh, um, uh, is being provided for Prop 98, specifically for special ed, and a $545 million increase to the special education base rate, uh, which is huge, as well as $100 million for the low incidence disabilities pool. And for those of you that either worked 
um, doing uh, school budgets or have worked in special education are intricately aware that um, the that we're just not funded for the true cost of special education from the state or the federal government. It really has a major impact on school budgets. So the fact that we're gonna see increases there is really going to be a powerful economic tool in the fiscal bucket for our local schools. Many of you have been, uh, may have watched the webinar that uh, Dave Walrath and I did a few weeks ago in regard to retirement. So this, this might be a refresher. Some of the numbers have changed just slightly, um, but we are seeing a total of $2.3 billion um, that's going to be savings to school and community colleges uh, because their CalPERS and their CalSTRS rates are essentially going to be reduced by about 2% for the next two fiscal years. So that is being provided by taking some of the extra payments that were made to CalPERS and CalSTRS in last year's budget. They're, they're saying, well, let's take that money back and instead of making an extra payment, let's just use that to make the school district's payments uh, for the next two years to provide them an additional cushion. Your And let me say, before I move on from that, your retirement will not be impacted. Your retirement is secured, it is guaranteed by the California Constitution. Um, if you didn't get a chance to see the webinar that Dave and I did, if you go to the CalRTA website, scroll down, there's a new webinar section. You can click on that section. I'd encourage you to watch that retirement webinar because I specifically go over a number of aspects about your retirement and how your retirement is secure. So with that, um, I wanted to put a pause. We have one more poll that I wanted to, uh, to uh, provide uh, and, uh, and uh, as a uh, query, and then we're gonna uh, move on to questions. Uh, so I first wanted to share, the uh, next wanted to share this poll with you uh, because we're trying to anticipate um, additional aspects that uh, that might impact our schools next year. And here's the question. Were you planning on working as a substitute teacher this next year? Yes or no? Because what we want to find out is whether or not the pandemic and whether or not the new restrictions that are happening with schools might impact whether or not you choose to come back as a substitute teacher because we know for those that we know there's a sub shortage, but we also know that if you were planning on working as a substitute teacher and you are age 65 or over because of the impact of the pandemic, that might your health, health your safety uh, might be uh, more important than getting the extra funds. And don't forget to click submit if you haven't clicked submit. And I wanna thank you for that. We're gonna go ahead and close the poll and let's share with you. So it looks like 89% of you, most of you were not planning on substituting, but 9% of you were uh, planning on substituting and are gonna continue, planning on continuing, And th but 3% of you were going to substitute, uh, but are now not going to. And what we're trying to do is anticipate um, some of the issues that might come up next year, because just because of the pandemic doesn't mean that the teacher shortage has gone away. Um, and in addition to that, and I'm gonna turn my screen back on, um, in addition to that, we're also anticipating that school, because school districts are so overwhelmed right now uh, with trying to figure out how they're gonna reopen schools and what that's gonna look like at the local level, um, they're not able to think about, are we gonna have enough teachers? Because we're also trying to anticipate are we likely to see more teachers retire so you don't have to go back? And then suddenly districts are gonna to have to scramble uh, for a substitute teacher and are they going to be available? So thank you so much for that. Um, so we did wanna share with you. Questions. And, and while we're doing questions and answers, uh, if you look on uh, right behind Susie and I, we've got additional webinars that are gonna be provided by CalRTA. Susie um, has, uh, uh, has been working on quite a, a bit of information, so you're likely to see more. I'm actually gonna be doing a budget webinar next week. So uh, shortly that's gonna be announced in the next day or two. So please take a look with that. You did receive uh, the preview, but I am gonna be going into some of those issues a little more deeply. 
So and on, on that yeah. note, I'm also going to be doing a, a webinar on navigating the website and virtual advocacy. So I go more into depth on how you to make it easy for you to be able to use our website on a regular basis. Um, I was looking at some of the questions and I'll I'll do a couple and then I want to kick them to you, Jennifer. But the big one that always comes up is email signups. And it was a good question. Why do I have to sign up? They already have my email. Why doesn't it go to all the 40,000 members? Um, thank goodness for Johanna and um, Angelique. They answer my emails like that. And if your email is on your personal information, then Johanna has it. You should be receiving the email signups. I know one of you said that you're constantly having to re sign up. Please contact Debbie Pate Newberry and Johanna if you need their emails, email me, and they will help you get re signed up and figure out what the issue is. Sometimes we accidentally kick ourselves out, and so they need to help us get back in. Another member asked, How many bills? have we previewed we preview a lot more usually but this recently we did 33 bills and we're going to do three ballot measures take positions on at our next um, grc meeting and the school opening guidelines there's a question about are we going to take a position if certain districts are either changing the distance regulation or doing things this all comes from the state as far as guidelines when we start looking at situations is when it hits the platform with the funding or the health of our students and our teachers so we'll be going into it more um, specifically but unfortunately at this time from the state it's just become recommendations so it's always important to stay on top and I will follow up and Dave and Jennifer with the Sonoma County regulations. How many attendees today? We had 35 attendees. And then the big key question, I know Jennifer will even go into it more at her next um, webinar is explaining deferrals. And I always call it kick the can. <laughs> so can you briefly explain deferrals to our participants? Hi. Yeah, I'll do it very briefly. And let me also note, because we're certainly, there are some very good questions out there and we're, we're already past time. So there isn't going to be enough time to answer all questions. But what we are going to do is take all of the questions and we're going to make sure we provide answers to those questions. And we'll make sure that we get that information on the website and provide it for you. And if you, any of your questions were budget related, I'm going to make sure that I uh, that I actually answer those as part of my presentation when I do the budget webinar next week. So thank you for helping me anticipate some of the questions that people might have. Uh, but just to do a, a very brief snippet on deferrals before we close it up, uh, a deferral basically says, uh, we're going to allow you to borrow money at the local level. So we're not gonna pay you, you go figure out how you can borrow money. But guess what? it costs money to borrow money. So the reality is while you're, while school districts are gonna go out and they're gonna figure out how they're gonna get that money, they're gonna have to pay interest. But they're only going to, let's say there's a um, hundred million dollars that you go out for that say, says, we're not gonna pay you a hundred million dollars, but you have the ability to go borrow a hundred million dollars. Well, when the school district pays back the 100 million that they borrow, they have to pay back a lot more than 100 million. And when the state pays the school district back, they give them 100 million. So guess what? Now there's a gap. So deferrals do cost money at the local level. Legislators and politicians in Sacramento don't like to acknowledge that. So essentially what it does is create a gap for our local districts at the same time if you had to ask the question what's worse having a deferral and having that gap or having straight up cuts right that's the quandary uh yeah. that we've had so that that's it in a nutshell but thank you to the person that asked that question i'm going to make it a point to do a yeah. lot more of an explanation in my workshop next week I did want to say thank you so much for taking the time to join us i have to tell you susie is working day and night and on weekends 
Oh, well, so make you, sure we're up to speed. You. But we do want to also remind you to um, look at the CalRTA website for the upcoming webinars because it is a lot of information today. So we're going to split it into two. And then we also have the lunch chats. I'm going to have a lunch chat on Tuesday at 1130 just to talk about the government relations group. So thank you everyone for coming and we definitely will um, get back and we do have another question. So we're going to answer all of them. So. Yep. We'll make sure that we do that. And you can always contact me or Susie individually, and we would be happy to help you with anything that we can. Thank you so much for taking time out on Thursday. And we hope to see you again in one of our upcoming webinars. I have an announcement for everyone. Uh, you will receive, the attendees will receive a follow-up email that will give you another opportunity to ask a question. And if you had your hand raised, we weren't able to address them. So if you don't have time to write your question under the question column, then you can uh, put it on the email that you will receive. Thank you both Susie and Jennifer. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And I Happy hope that you all have a, a safe and happy weekend. Happy fourth too. Thank yeah. you so much, everyone. Bye.